In our last speech, freedom or death, Emily Pankhurst mentioned this guy, Edward Carson, and Irish home rule. In the next couple of videos, we'll discover who Edward Carson was, what the heck this Irish home rule shenanigans is all about, and the collision between Irish and English history. Then we'll deliver Edward Carson's speech, Ulster is asking to be let alone. This is Speaking Through the Ages, where we bring back the dead in an attempt to bring out the values, beliefs, and internal struggles of those humans that came before. We give context to and deliver historical speeches that motivated people to kill, riot, make salt, and sign papers. In previous videos, we touched on a little British history and what exactly the UK is. But today, we're going to focus on how Ireland became part of the United Kingdom, and this should help with some historical context. Just a heads up, it may seem like we're diverting back into pure English history, but I promise it is relevant, and it'll all come together by the end. To recap, the British Isles are essentially three islands, Great Britain, Ireland, and the Isle of Man. We have focused a great deal on Great Britain and its political situation in the early 1900s. At this point in time, Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. Spoiler alert! That's about to change. But let's back way up to get our head around Ireland and its history. Gaelic Ireland refers to Irish culture and political and social order from the prehistoric era until the 17th century. Initially pagan, eventually, perhaps as early as the first century, it evolved into a Christian culture. In the 9th century, Vikings began raiding and settling along Ireland's coast and waterways, which became the first large towns. The Normans, who were descendants of the Vikings in the northeast in northeast France, evaded in, in 1169. The clash of natives and foreigners resulted in various wars and infighting. It was a cluster of clans and territories ruled by kings and chiefs, and like the rest of Europe, had a hierarchical structure. In 1542, Henry VIII of England conquered and declared himself King of Ireland. The English and Irish traversed back and forth, conquering and reconquering the island. But through a few more conquests under Henry VIII, Queen Elizabeth I, and James I, by 1607, Ireland was fully under English control, bringing the old Gaelic era to an end. Of course, there were rebellions, but more on that later. Before 1603, Scotland and England were two different kingdoms, with Ireland under English control for the time being. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of how they all became united under one crown. King Henry VII, who ruled from 1485 until his death in 1509, became king by seizing the crown in the War of Roses, which, fun fact, is what the popular series, uh, HBO series Game of Thrones is loosely based on. The details of this are fun and crazy, but all we really need out of this is the family tree. King Henry VII had a number of children, but the two most important ones for our story were Margaret Tudor and Henry VIII. Margaret was the oldest of two and married James IV, King of Scotland. They had James V, their only surviving child, who married Mary of Guise and had their only surviving child, Mary Stuart. James V died when she was only an infant, making Mary Queen of Scots almost from birth. She went on to marry her first cousin and have James VI. Okay, James VI. Hold that lineage in your mind. I'm kidding. In summary, remember that James VI, his great-grandmother, was Margaret Tudor, who was the sister of King Henry VIII. Henry VIII had like a bazillion wives. So try and stay with me here, but I promise this is kind of important but mostly fun, mostly just for fun. Before King Henry VIII became fed up with his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, for her numerous miscarriages and inability to produce a male heir, they had their only child, Mary I or Mary Tudor. Shortly after, or during, the king started to have an affair with Catherine's personal assistant, Mary Bolin, through which she became enamored with Mary Bolin's sister, Anne. Because the Catholic Pope would not annul his marriage with, with uh, Catherine so he could marry Anne, he started the English Reformation, breaking from the authority of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. This essentially made the king the supreme head on earth of the Church of England. Henry VIII, with his new powers, then annulled his marriage to Catherine and Mary Anne Bolin. They had the child Elizabeth Tudor. But it didn't take long for the king to get fed up with Anne's superior intellect and inability to act the submissive wife and produce a male heir. 
He eventually charged her with incest and adultery and had her beheaded, all based on little evidence. The king uh, married his next mistress, Jane Seymour, through which he had Edward VI. Jane died from an infection shortly after birth. Edward VI went on to succeed his father at the age of nine, but died at 15. He tried to bypass giving the crown to either of his half-sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, by giving the crown to his cousin once removed, Lady Jane Grey. However, Mary quickly gained Catholic support and was given the crown nine days after King Edward VI died. Mary became known as Bloody Mary with her ruthless treatment and policies dealing with the Protestants. However, because she never produced an heir, upon her death, the crown fell to her Protestant sister, Elizabeth, known as Queen Elizabeth I. She never married, nor had children, which meant the crown went to her first cousin twice removed, Margaret Tudor's great-grandson, James VI, now King of Scotland, and his new title was James I of the United Ireland, Scotland, and English Crowns. Obviously, up until now, throughout Ireland's entire history, the territory shifted sizes and changed names. But it was James I who set the four provinces of Ireland, Connacht, Leinster, Munster, and Ulster. The Irish had a major Catholic population who suffered at the hands of the Protestant English church, kings, and parliament. Throughout the 17th century, a series of laws known as the Penal Laws were put into place to force the Irish Roman Catholics and Protestant dissenters, like Presbyterians, to reform to the Protestant church as defined by the English state. The Crown carried out policies to create new towns and boroughs. They confiscated land from the Irish Catholics in Munster and Ulster to make room for the Scottish and English Protestant settlers who formed the new ruling British class in Ireland. By 1614, the Catholic majority in the Irish House of Commons was overthrown, although the Catholic majority in the Irish House of Lords held until 1689. More penal laws were aimed at Catholics, Baptists, and Presbyterians to encourage conversion to the English Church. Laws that banned Protestant dissenters from voting, holding public offices, intermarriage, holding fire firearms, or serving in the armed forces. The 17th century was perhaps the bloodiest in Ireland's history. Fueled by the fear of the anti-Catholic English parliaments expanding powers over the king, the Irish Catholics rebelled against the Protestant overlords. Because the English Civil War between the Parliamentarians and the Royalists was well underway in 1642, there was not many forces to put the rebellion down. A series of massacres ensued on the English Protestant settlers, particularly in Ulster. The Parliamentarians eventually defeated the Royalists and executed Charles I. Historically, this was a massive swing in power from the king into the Parliament. The Parliamentarians then turned their attention back to Ireland and reconquered it. As punishment for the Irish Rebellion during the English Civil War, all of the Irish lands were confiscated and all the Catholics were transplanted to Connacht. More penal laws were inflicted and the Irish Catholics found themselves once again persecuted by the English. The Irish Catholic population became the poor peasant class and, the struggle throughout the, and they struggled throughout the mid-17th to the mid-18th century, right up until the anti-Catholic laws were eventually revoked and rescinded. But more on that in the next video. Thanks for exploring the ages with us. In this video, we covered how the UK became united under one crown in the contentious Irish and English political landscape. Throughout Speaking Through the Ages, we'll encounter different people, cultures, and histories. We'll cover more details and reveal little by little as each piece requires. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And remember, if you like this video, be sure to light up that subscribe button and click the bell for notifications. Or leave comments to correct any errors, exaggerations, or perfunctory explanations this novice history fan gets wrong. See you next time, where the dead teach. <laughs>